Welcome to this comprehensive guide of post-operative tips for total hip replacement surgery. Welcome to my co-host, Mike the Cat. I know some of you would have been disappointed if Mike wasn't part of this video, so he's here with us today, and he's telepathically sending me some messages that he'd like me to share with you. So the first thing I wanted to share from Mike is that this is probably my most ambitious video project to date, by far. It's gonna contain a ton of information. It was done in collaboration with others, and as such, I wanted to give you some specific information up front. So first off, if this is the first time you're watching this video, I'd really encourage you to watch the whole thing from start to finish, especially the information at the beginning, because I'm gonna provide some background and some context that should help make the video easier to navigate and easier to use. Personally, Mike thinks it would be helpful to listen to this video multiple times, because each time you hear it, you might pick up different things. That said, you probably don't need to listen to the background and the context each time and you want to jump right to the tips. So if you want to jump right to the tips, Mike and I would suggest you jump forward to this point in the video. If you're anxious to get directly to one tip or topic in particular, then look in the video description where I've chaptered everything. That will allow you to hop around as you wish. Now there's something very important Mike wants to ask you. If you find this video at all helpful in your hip journey, then please pay it forward. There are hundreds of people every day who just found out that they're facing total hip replacement. They're joining the forums, they're trying to gather information, and I can't reach them all. So if you encounter these folks, please let them know about this video, let them know about my channel and my hip vlogs. I can't reach everybody, unfortunately, so your help in this would be very much appreciated. And trust me, those people will thank you as well. Now I've tried to organize these videos into sections, and I've included these little section tabs up in the top center of the screen. So that should allow you to fast forward. So if you wanna see the tips for one week after surgery versus two months after surgery, you can kind of zip forward and look at those things. What's that, Mike? What are you saying? Oh yeah, if you think you know why I picked this background for this video, then please leave a note in the comments. I'd be curious to see what your guesses are. My goal in creating this video guide was to create something comprehensive, not just representing my own personal tips, but those of others as well, as well as my surgeon. So as we start off, I'd like to thank all the others who have helped me make this video possible. Specifically, I'd like to call out Kiana, Paula, Rob, Heidi, Libby, Vicky, Anya, etc. Those folks have really helped by providing their own tips or providing commentary or corrections to my tips. I'd like to mention Rob in particular because he said, unfortunately, medical professionals don't take the time to document and share this info. But my surgeon actually did, and I think he was a pretty good surgeon. He compiled pages and pages of detailed notes for me based on his own experience and decades long surgical career doing thousands of total hip replacements, including his own personal experiences having undergone two total hip replacements himself on two separate occasions. So I've got the content of this video organized into different sections, but within each section, first I present my surgeon's tips, then my tips, and then the tips of others. Before we get started, I'm sure we missed some things. So if there are any important tips that we've missed in this video, please leave them in the comments and I'll keep those in mind for a future video. In terms of the tips that I'll provide, I think it's important to know a little bit about my hip journey. So I'm 55 years old and underwent hip surgery in January of 2023. I'd been suffering with pain in my groin and my knee for probably six or seven months before I had it properly diagnosed as a hip problem. I decided not to wait too long for my hip surgery because I didn't want my body to compensate and to develop other problems. So I was fairly fit going into surgery and that I think has served me well in my recovery. I realized that your hip journey might not be like mine, but that's okay. Each of our hip journeys is specific to ourselves, but I still think a lot of these tips are relevant and helpful to hippies, no matter what their personal situation may be. As you watch and listen, please think about your own individual circumstances and how these tips might apply to you or not, or maybe in some sort of modified fashion based on your own particular circumstances. We all like to believe that we had the absolute best surgeon out there, but I do think that there are a few things that set my surgeon apart from most of the others. First, he had an extremely low complication rate. It was around 0.3%. My surgeon was also an avid windsurfer, so he was very active, and he underwent two total hip replacements himself. But not only did he do that, he used it as an opportunity to try and understand what his patients were experiencing and reporting back to him. So while I'm sure there are many excellent surgeons out there, and I'm sure your surgeon was very good, I do have high confidence in my surgeon, Dr. K. And so I'm sharing a lot of the information that he provided me in this video. This is the disclaimer for the fast voiceover. I am not a doctor or medical professional of any kind. I underwent right total hip replacement January 23rd of 2023. Right up until the week before surgery, I was a very fit and active 55-year-old. 
This video represents the collective wisdom of myself, Woody Abler, by actively participating in several forms of support groups for seven months, and for my surgeon, Dr. K, who has an extremely low 0.3% complication rate, has performed thousands of total hip replacements, and has had both of his hips replaced as well. I repeat, I am not a medical professional. The tips and advice presented here should be taken with a grain of salt. Use common sense when applying any information pertaining to your health, and make sure to consider other factors such as your age, general health and comorbidities, fitness level, your country, your surgeon, and the type of procedure you underwent for joint replacement. Apply the information presented here to your own risk, and remember, we are all unique individuals, so our hip journeys will necessarily differ. As always, I wish you the absolute best in your hip journey. Peace out, my hippies. Now, if you want to listen to that more slowly so it's easier to understand, you can go ahead and adjust the speed in the YouTube settings. One of my collaborators, Libby Spong, had this to say, your progress will vary, and that can depend on many different factors. But imagine this, someone who's been suffering with a bad hip for many years due to a birth defect or just not being able to get their script, will, will have... For example, if you have your total hip replacement surgery early on in the process, like I did, before your body's been compensating for it for a long time and developed other problems, you'll have a very different recovery from someone who had to wait several years for their hip surgery, whether that be due to it being a long-running birth defect or delays in health care or insurance or any number of other reasons. But suffice it to say, the recoveries of those two individuals is going to be very different. Another collaborator, Vicky, had this to offer. Aftercare can be slightly different depending upon your surgeon and the surgical approach he took. So listen to your doctor and follow instructions. But don't be afraid to speak up and ask questions. This is your hip journey after all. Based on the way I'm dressed today, you might think I'm a successful doctor or surgeon, but that's not the case. I'm not a medical professional. But today I wanted to talk to you about all the different information we get from our medical professionals. There's really not a consensus out there about a lot of different things when it comes to total hip replacement. So, for example, I'm going to share with you some educational information that I got at the hospital when I was having my hip replacement surgery done. And what you see is they have a bunch of exercises on here, but then they have certain things crossed out. And there's a note here that says, not intended for Dr. X's hip replacement patients. And then if I turn the page, there's another big section. In fact, you can see like three quarters of this page is crossed out, this whole section and this whole section. And there's another note that says, not intended for Dr. Y's patients. You know, when you ask 10 different surgeons a question about total hip replacement, you'll get 10 different answers. And doctors are making their best educated guesses on how to direct their patients in terms of restrictions and recovery and things like that. So remember, whatever you hear, take it with a grain of salt and you are really responsible for your own recovery and making the best possible educated decisions for your own particular hip journey. In a similar vein, I don't want you to take anything that you hear in any of my videos as absolute truth. I want you to question everything and try and apply it to your individual circumstances in a logical way. As you will gather from watching this video and participating in various support groups, the answers to many questions can vary a lot because our hip journeys can all be very different. My doctor, Dr. K, told me one of the things that was most different was whether or not a person had bone on bone in their hip joint or if they still had some cartilage left. And he actually did a little experiment. He had to have both of his hips replaced at different times in his life. And one of them he had done when it was bone on bone, and the other one he had done when it was earlier and there was still some cartilage left. Because he was trying to understand what his patients were telling me about the experience, and they were very different. So what he told me is that when you're down to bone on bone, you can feel immediate relief after surgery. It's really a very quick healing process, and again, the, the relief is almost immediate. The difference is if you have cartilage and some you know, tissue still in your joint, then there's a lot of inflammation and the surgical process just exacerbates that. And that inflammation can take up to a year to clear up entirely. So when you have a lot of inflammation and you have some cartilage left and some tissue in your hip joint, then that can take a much longer time to resolve itself and heal. Now I'd like to share one of the top tips that all of us should bear in mind as we recover from total hip replacement. This is from a website called BoneSmart. Big tip, hips actually don't need any exercise to get better. They do a pretty good job of it all on their own if given half a chance. Trouble is, people don't give them a chance and end up with all sorts of aches and pains and sore spots. All they need is the best therapy, which is walking, and even then, not to excess. This is a good overall guiding principle for our hip recoveries. My top tip is to know what to expect the day of surgery and the first week after surgery. I've got two videos that have proved very helpful in this. Number one is my day of surgery video, which I actually filmed while in the hospital. And number two is hip surgery surprises, which covers the things that really surprised me that first week after surgery. Based on user comments, these have been very helpful videos, so please check them out.
on the topic of support groups, I will tell you that finding Pete's YouTube channel was crucial for me because when I found out I was going to be scheduled for the surgery, I wanted information. So I started searching out all the things and I stumbled upon YouTube was searching out hip replacement surgery and I found Pete's channel and he had some really great videos on there that were kind of giving like the play by play of his recovery. And it was through my conversation on YouTube in his comment section that I found some of these Facebook support groups. So I was so thankful for his content on YouTube and it really had inspired me to make sure that I was sharing on my TikTok. Um, because I felt like there was going to be more people that needed that same information. So thankful to, t to Pete for putting his information out there because for me, it was really, really crucial in helping me get connected where I needed to get connected for my recovery. Let's talk about support groups. Should you join them? Should you not? I would say overall, I recommend joining support groups. Um, I found myself, I found in three different ones on Facebook. There may be some Reddit groups as well. I particularly found mine on Facebook because that's where I spend the most of my time on, you know, some sort of social platform. Um, and the reason that I like these groups is number one, you do feel validated. There's other people, thousands of people going through the same thing that you are. For me, it was very important to find them because I'm very young. My hip was replaced at 39 and I felt like I was on an island by myself without anybody in my same age bracket that was going through this. So reaching out to these groups was really helpful for me. I will say, take what you get in there with a grain of salt. The human tendency is to report on the bad stuff and not the good stuff. So oftentimes in these groups, you'll find a lot of like really bad experiences, really bad reviews, not as many good. And it's because that's just generally how we operate. If you have a really good experience at a restaurant, how how apt are you to go on to like Yelp and leave a, a good review? Probably not very. Some people might, but I think the majority of people that leave reviews, it's because it's a bad review. Negative things stick in our minds much more as humans for some odd reason. So take what you hear in there with a grain of salt. Understand that there are many different reasons people have bad experiences. So my experience is going to be completely different than someone who was in their 70s chances are they will have a harder time recovering than I do because we are in completely different phases of our lives. Um, I am extremely active. I was up until the day before surgery and um, kept myself healthy. Although I had gained some weight prior to surgery because of my mobility limitations, I still kept moving the entire time before surgery. Someone who's in their 70s is probably not at that same activity level, so their experience will be different. Thanks, Kiana. If you'd like to follow Kiana, check her out on Instagram. She's Kiana11, and her name is Kiana White. I wanted to echo what Kiana shared about Facebook groups. The Facebook support groups for hip replacement are great, but there are so many that you have to know which ones are the best ones to join. So I created a video here, which walks you through the process. And there are different groups depending on what your particular situation is. So there are groups for just everyone. There are groups for people who are younger and fit and active, etc. So try to pick a group that's appropriate for you and participate actively. Now, I would like to add that some groups restrict your freedom of speech. And so I'm not always able to help people in all the ways that I'd like to. So I've started my own fledgling hip support group on Facebook. Mike and I hope you'll join us there. This section is called Timeless Tips. These are some overall tips that you should bear in mind during your overall hip journey and recovery. Today I'm wearing the very first Game of Life 411 t-shirt. I've got this out there on my YouTube store, and like everything else about this channel, this is not for profit, so it's being offered at cost. And I really hope people will, will buy these and wear them out in public as a way to get more exposure for my channel and help more people become aware of it. I met with the graphic designer who designed this shirt just a couple days ago to start working on the next design. You'll be happy to know it will include Mike the Cat, my co-host. I'm going to start off this section of the video by reading some notes from my Dr. K. The most important thing that he told me that I try to remind myself on a regular basis is that complete recovery from total hip replacement can take up to a year. You might feel great, you might on the outside look great and be able to do a lot of stuff, but inside your body there's still some healing going on. So here's what he had to say, and again, I'm reading from some of the notes that he provided me while I was in the hospital first nine months post-operatively. This is the most vulnerable period for your hip. Initial fixation is similar to a nail driven into wood. This holds well for about two to four weeks. At two to four weeks, the bone remodels to prepare for ingrowth. The process starts with bone resorption, which initially weakens fixation slash attachment. 
So this really surprised me. So what that tells you is that within a couple of weeks after your surgery, the fixation of your implant actually weakens because the bone is sort of resorbing into itself. The bone is retracting away from the implant initially. By nine months, bone will have grown into the rough surface of your implants. Ingrowth initially is like fresh grass. The first growth is weak or delicate and can be overloaded and die. The secondary ingrowth is like secondary grass. You can drive a car on it. You can't kill it. Just like a nail in wood can work loose, you can work a hip implant loose before the bone can grow into it. The bone is racing to grow into your implant before you can work it loose. This is an easy race to win if you listen to your hip and don't overdo it. The key sign that you're overdoing it is thigh pain. Thigh pain is a sign of your overstressing the tight wedge fixation of your hip implant. When sudden trauma, a fall, a jump, or a twist happens, you can drive the implant further into the bone just like driving a nail further into wood and split the bone. Listen to your body and your hip. Pacing yourself is an investment you're making in the final result you obtain. With common sense, the odds are greater than 98% you'll get an excellent outcome. And he did provide some pictures here, which I may try to scan so that they're more visible in the video. But you can see that these kind of explain the splitting of wood, the forces driving into the implant into your bone and how that might split it, things like that. One of the things that really surprised me after surgery was that my surgeon said that I could do three things. I could walk, I could stand, or I could lay on a flat surface like a bed or a couch, whether propped up or lying down. That really surprised me because I had envisioned sitting a lot and inviting people over to play cards and do things like that. So lying on a flat surface was really kind of a surprise for me and not a position that I really enjoy sitting in. It's very uncomfortable for me. Dr. K had the following to say, laying flat, walking, or standing erect is best for the following reasons. Least stress on the wound and incision. It keeps veins from kinking and clotting. It's the best position for the implant. He goes on. Once the patient is comfortable on one or no crutch, I still recommend caution on stairs for the first eight weeks. Loading the implant with walking is much safer than loading implant on stairs. On stairs, you're twisting the implant in the canal. And he really emphasized this every time I talked to him as a high risk. So while I was moving on to lots of other activities and I was walking unaided, I still continued to walk up and down stairs one step at a time rather than step over step. So walking was a really big part of my recovery. And I tried to take this to heart, although I did do lots of other things, not specific to my hip, but to improve my overall fitness and get back to the activities that I love. So I hope you'll watch this video. I think it does a pretty good job of showing the stages of recovery through walking. So you can see my progress. And even if you're progressing slower or faster, I think it's helpful to see the different stages of progress. Check it out. One of the most important tips that I share with people about recovery through walking is to make sure that you walk with the proper gait from day one. It doesn't matter as much how far you're going as long as you're going with the proper gait. And sometimes this can be harder or easier depending on the situation you're in. For me, it took quite a bit of focus, but I made sure that I was walking correctly. That's important because it reinforces good body mechanics, good muscle use, etc. Policy, one of my collaborators on this video, wanted to share these notes from her surgeon. He said, at four weeks post-op, you'll be about 10% healed. At three months post-op, you'll be about 50% healed. That info has literally saved me, Paula C., as I second-guess myself in my healing. Am I walking far enough comparing myself to others? I do know that every step we take after surgery is another step toward recovery. Sitting after total hip replacement can be very uncomfortable, and that really surprised me. Make sure that when you sit, you're sitting so that your knee is not higher than your hip, because that would put your hip at a bad angle. So you might need to use a booster in order to maintain the proper angle. I'm using one right now, although it's mostly to get me into the frame of the picture. But for several months after total hip replacement, I used a booster and I took it with me everywhere I went. I took it with me to church. I took it with me when I went driving in the van or a car. I took it with me on vacations and trips and on airplanes. So everywhere I went, I wanted to make sure that I had a proper angle in my hip and my knee. My surgeon, Dr. K, said, avoid sitting for long periods of time. And if you can't avoid it, set an alarm so that you get up every hour and go for a short walk. My surgeon, Dr. K, said, no recliners. 
And one of my collaborators, Julie, said this is because it's the position of the hips and the difficulty of getting out of a recliner or couch. You have to lean forward, which puts your new hip past a 90 degree angle. When you're sitting and standing, you should be moving your body up and down in a straight up motion to keep the new implant aligned while healing. One of my tips is regardless of what stage of recovery you're in, stay ahead of the pain because that can affect all kinds of things, including your gait. A lot of times when people limp, it's not because of something physical, it's because of the pain. So make sure that you stay ahead of the pain in all stages of your recovery and maintain that proper gait. One of the most common questions that I see on the forums is when can I fill in the blank? When can I drive, ditch my walker, swim, do kung fu, uh, ride a bike, go running, play volleyball or tennis, return to work, a million different things. And the problem with these questions is that there's no one answer. Everybody's hip journey is different. And the answer for you is going to depend on many different things, which is why I created this video. But the bottom line is that there's no one answer. So just try and find out what you can and judge the best for your individual circumstance. Now this is a very important tip, and people warned me about this before I had my total hip replacement. Don't overdo it and suffer a setback. Just take slow, steady progress. Now I suffered a couple setbacks, one very early on my first outdoor walk. I was just walking with my wife and I felt so good that we lost track of time and I ended up walking for about 40 minutes. Well, I sure suffered for it the next day. But I took a step back, I rested for a day, and then I started on a much shorter walk the day after that and was able to get back into a good walking routine. I also had a setback at about five months when I was trying to lose some of the weight that I'd gained. I was being very active, I was watching my diet, and again, suffered a setback. So you really have to be careful about that and just take a break, do a reset, and then start off at a lower level of what it ever... Oh. <laughs> So take my advice and the advice of many others and avoid overdoing it so that you can avoid setbacks. Now, if you do suffer a setback, just take a deep breath, do a reset, take a little break, and then restart whatever that activity was at a slightly lower level. After surgery, it's likely that your hip is gonna be very swollen, so wear loose-fitting, comfortable clothes. Be prepared for other aches and pains during your recovery. These can be for a number of reasons. Trauma from having major surgery, your body reacclimating after having compensated for your bad hip for who knows how long, and discontinuing anti-inflammatories. I was surprised by how many aches and pains I had that were seemingly unrelated to my hip replacement. For example, right after surgery, I had sort of tendonitis in my opposite elbow, my knees were sore and hurting, and when I would go for a walk, the end of my walk was sort of on a slight uphill, and my knees would pop and shift and stuff, and they were kind of painful. Uh, my lower back was experiencing a lot of discomfort. So all these things can happen. They're all very normal and for the reasons I listed a minute ago. I just got back from a deep tissue massage and realized that I almost forgot to include that here in my tips video. I remember very clearly after surgery that first week, my operative thigh was in a lot of pain. It was very sort of stiff and sore and sort of burning. And so at 10 days post-op, I went to get a deep tissue massage and I asked her to really focus on that thigh. It hurt like the devil for the rest of that day, but the next day it felt so much better. So I would recommend deep tissue massage as appropriate. I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you start something like that if you aren't used to doing it, but if you have had massages before or you have a trusted masseuse, then I think it can really help you during your recovery from hip replacement surgery. I go every week or two and usually ask them to work on different things. Your body's undergone a lot of trauma, both from compensating before hip surgery and then also compensating and trying to recover from the trauma of hip surgery. So there are going to be lots of muscles messed up and things that a deep tissue massage might help with. Another tip is to just pay attention to your body and give it what it needs. What I mean by this is, regardless of whether you're seeing a physical therapist or not, pay attention to how things are working. For example, I found that I could walk for miles and miles no problem at all, but when I encountered a gradual incline or had to walk up steps, I found that my operative leg was very, very weak doing those motions. 
And so I went ahead and did some strengthening exercises, some static lunges, some uh, leg extensions using a machine and things like that. Nothing super aggressive, but I started working on it over time and that really did make a difference. So pay attention to your body and to your recovery. Try to identify the areas that need some work and work toward making those better. Okay, I feel like I'm in character here. My surgeon actually was a windsurfer. So if I look like sort of a beach bum, then that's probably a good thing because I'm going to read to you his patient hip replacement experience. If you recall from earlier in the video, I shared that my surgeon, Dr. K, had actually had both of his hips replaced and at two different stages of decay. So at any rate, when uh, I was admitted into the hospital, one of the pieces of information that they gave me was this write-up that he provided. So it's entitled Patient Hip Replacement Experience. Having had my own hip replaced, I've learned some things that might help you. Your hip will start healing immediately after surgery and will burn calories like a furnace. You'll feel best during the first 36 hours after surgery, but by five to seven days, this furnace will catch up with you and for two to three days, you'll feel exhausted. Now, in my personal case, that was absolutely true. I ran a temperature. I felt like I was suffering from the flu or something. It was really weird. I was totally exhausted and knocked out. Okay, to continue. The first week after recovery can be really rough on many of us. So I'd highly recommend that you have someone there to help you. In my case, it was my wife. Related to this, I would also suggest that you try it very, very hard to be a good patient. So. I really didn't want to take advantage of my wife, and my wife wanted to help me and, and be good to me, so we came out of that experience with me saying that my wife was an absolute angel, and she actually said that I was a good patient, which, you know, that's a good pat on the back for me. I, I think mission accomplished considering how miserable I felt that first week. In my case, what happened is that after a few days, I was able to do most things for myself, and then for the next couple weeks, the main thing that my wife helped me with were putting on and taking off the compression socks each day. So my surgeon's instructions were to wear the compression socks during the day, but obviously I needed help taking them off at night, and then I needed to have them off when I took a shower in the morning. So that was really the main thing my wife had to help me with after the first week. If you think you can tough it out, then please watch my video, Hip Surgery Surprises. That goes over a lot of the things that really surprised me that first week after surgery. And one of the major things was how awful I felt and how weak and how fatigued. I felt like I had a serious flu. So check it out and hopefully that'll help you prepare. Now, if you don't have someone that can help you the first week after surgery, then there are ways to prepare. I didn't do that myself, so I'm not gonna share any specific tips on that, but I know on the forums there are lots of people who did this. So you can look for their advice. Also during the first week, you may find stairs to be challenging, or perhaps you just don't wanna risk going up and down stairs a lot. Some hippies who have second floor bedrooms will actually arrange to sleep on the first floor of their home for the first week after surgery. I have a friend who did this, but in my case, I was able to make it up the stairs the day of surgery. However, after that, I will admit that I really didn't wanna risk the stairs for several days, and so I stayed on the second floor of our house. That's why it was important that my wife was there to bring me food, <laughs> otherwise I don't know what would have happened. As I was convalescing that first week after hip replacement, I had a folder sitting by my side that contained all the paperwork and information that they provided me at the hospital and from my surgeon. And each day I'd read and reread all that material because what I found is that every day I read it, something new would stick in my mind or perhaps I'd experienced something that resonated with something that I read in the information and that really helped. So for example, a couple days in, I was suffering from a ton of swelling. And you can see how I addressed that in this video here. But suffice it to say, I was reading the material and I found a particular note that talked about the swelling and that really helped me. So I'd highly recommend that for that first week, you just read and reread that material that you received. As you reread it, different things will make an impression on you. And I really found that to be very, very helpful. In a similar vein, I hope you'll watch this video more than one time because I really think that there's a lot of information here. It's probably too much to absorb in, in one stint, but as you listen to it multiple times or even if you listen to it at different times in your recovery, different things will stick out and hopefully help you. So two of the gadgets that were unbelievably helpful to me during my recovery was my wedge pillow and my grabber. The grabber is because most of us will have uh, bending restrictions, some of us longer than others, some not as long, and some aren't as restrictive, um, but most of us will have some sort of bending restrictions, and honestly, you, you just really don't want to bend for a while. Like, you just don't want to. So, the first thing is the grabber. 
This is the one that I got. There are different like lengths, um, but this one was really easy to use. It's got like these grippies on the end. And this you can not only use to pick things up off the floor, but you can also use it to help pull your clothes on because that is a little bit challenging in the beginning. So that is this, the grabber. Second tool was my wedge pillow. This is the one that I got off of Amazon. So basically your feet will sit up here. Your, so basically your like butt will be pushed up against this part. Your feet will go up here. And this really helped for swelling. Um, swelling for me was substantial. I think everybody kind of has different swelling experiences. Mine was pretty decent. Um, and when you're sleeping, at least for me, I found it really, really helpful to have my legs elevated. Um, I pretty much had them elevated, I would say 95% of the time. And this was an awesome buy off of Amazon. I think this was about $25, if I'm not mistaken. So any wedge pillow like this, I highly, highly, highly recommend. Let's talk about things that surprised me. Things that surprised me. Number one, how sore my quad was. I can't speak to people that had lateral, which is on the side, or posterior, which is on the back. I don't know if their experiences are the same. I know anterior for me, which is on the front of my thigh, um, it left my quad unbelievably sore. I, my quad has never been that sore in my entire life. And I am a personal trainer and I teach group fitness and I have done some extreme workouts in my life and I have never been this sore in my quads ever. I felt like I did 8,000 million squats. It was completely insane. Um, it probably lasted for the first four or five days. I did a lot of icing. Um, my pain meds helped a little bit, but honestly, the surgery pain was second to just my quad soreness. And it really was just a soreness. It felt like I had an epic day in the gym. That's what it felt like. Number two thing that surprised me, um, was how tired I was. I was absolutely exhausted. And I think it had to do with a combination of the medication, which narcotics do make you tired. I was on my narcotics for about five days. Narcotics do make you tired. So that was part of it. The other part of it was just the just surgery. It's an, it's a major surgery. Your body goes through pretty severe, like trauma when you have the surgery done and it's a routine surgery, but it's still a very serious surgery. And I was exhausted. I slept for the, probably the first 72 hours. I slept for 18 hours a day. It was so much sleeping. It was unbelievable. So that was the second thing that really, really surprised me. Third thing was how difficult it was to go to the bathroom. Number two, <laughs> going number two to the bathroom was very challenging. They do, do give you some medication to help with that. Um, but unfortunately when your body is pumped full of just these different drugs that they use for surgery, it makes that very challenging. So I didn't expect it to be that difficult. If you've had a lot of surgeries, you might be used to that. This is only my second surgery in my life. So for me, I was not expecting that and I was very surprised by that. So those would be my top three things that really, really surprised me. Here's a tip from Vicki, one of my collaborators. She says memory foam mattresses can be difficult to navigate the first couple weeks post-op. So if you've got a memory foam mattress, you might want to look at alternatives. Let's talk about some of the things that I want to just kind of give you generic tips on. Um, number one, sleep as much as you can. Don't fight the sleep, just allow yourself to sleep, especially that first week. You really need sleep. Most of our healing comes through the sleeping process. So don't fight the sleep, L allow yourself to sleep. Just do it, like succumb to the sleep. It's gonna make you feel like you're being overtaken by it. Don't fight it, just go ahead and sleep. Um, the first 10 days, let's talk about the first 10 days or so. Might be longer for some, might be shorter for others. For me, it was the first 10 days. When you wake up in the morning, the stiffness in your hip is on another level. Something that I did not expect, actually. The first probably 20 to 30 steps are so hard. They're not necessarily painful because the pain post-op is completely different than the pain pre-op, at least for me and I think most of the people that I've talked with. But they're very uncomfortable. You're very stiff. Like The stiffness is, again, on another level. So that first... 20, 30 steps, you're, you're going to dread it. Every morning you're going to dread it. It's just going to be something that you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Do it. Walk through it, push through it. Once you get through those first 20 or 30 steps, I promise it gets better. So just keep moving. Uh, enjoy the downtime. That's another tip that I have. You know, how often for most of us do we just get to 
do nothing. Not very often. And now we're given this opportunity to just chill. A lot of us resist that, especially if we're younger. Again, I'm in my 30s getting my hip replacement done. This might be a little bit different for someone that's up in age. Maybe you're already retired or well beyond retirement years. This might be something you're a little more used to. For those of us who are still in the working age bracket um, or we're parents or whatever, we are not used to this downtime. So my suggestion to you is if you are new to this downtime game, just enjoy it. Like you have a complete excuse to just veg. You know, catch up on Netflix, read a book. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to my family and friends on the phone, video chat as well. I just took advantage of the downtime um, when I wasn't sleeping. I was just kind of enjoying it because it's not very often I get to do that. So really, really enjoy your downtime. This section focuses on weeks one through six post-op. This is probably the media section of the video. And so before we get started, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the video and about my channel. Creating quality content like this video takes a ton of time and effort. I started planning this video two or three months ago, and for the last two weeks I've worked on it full time, spending well over 100 hours. Yesterday I was up at 3 a.m. and worked the entire day on the video, and today I've had two Zoom calls with collaborators trying to finalize certain details. I don't do this because I love creating video content. I do it because I love helping people. So if you found today's video helpful, there are a couple of meaningful ways you can let me know. I absolutely love it and get very excited every time I see a new subscriber to my channel or see a comment posted on one of my videos. And even though I spend an hour or two every day on the various hip support groups, I can't reach everybody, so I really appreciate it when you share my content with others facing or recovering from hip replacement surgery. It's really easy. You just copy the URL up in the top of your browser bar and then paste it into a Facebook comment or an email or text to share with your friends, family, or other members of support groups. So thanks in advance for your support. It's helping people like you that really keeps me going. It's entitled Patient Hip Replacement Experience. Having had my own hip replaced, I've learned some things that might help you. Complications can increase with muscle sparing operations when patients feel so good that they overdo activities and irritate soft tissue wound, muscles, etc., or overload the bone. Again, in my case, early on I did have a, a situation like this. I was going for my first outdoor walk and was with my wife and it just felt so good I kept going for probably 40 minutes and I did suffer after that. But, you know, you just learn from that, reset, and ease back into something that's more reasonable. Medically, patients struggle post-operatively the most with three things. Gastrointestinal, sleep, and depression. Okay, under gastrointestinal, he mentions constipation, nausea, and appetite. He says it's normal. He says normal bowel function can be achieved by aggressively taking medica medications. Constipation after hip surgery, or in fact after many surgeries, is no joke, especially when you're taking opioids, which can cause that constipation or make it worse. I really struggled for several days and just felt so bloated and uncomfortable. When I finally got past that point, it was such a relief. Sleep. Sleep can be improved by controlling the pain and sleep medications. Eventually, you will struggle to come off these medications, but for the first three to four weeks, getting adequate sleep is more important. So personally, what I would try and do is, as I got closer to bedtime, I would, that's when I would start taking my medications, I would do my icing, I would reduce my activities that might cause additional discomfort or pain during the nighttime, and then I would start taking the medications. I never used a prescription sleep aid post-operatively, although I did try one uh, pre-op, and I didn't really like it, so I discontinued it. Post-operatively, I just used over-the-counter aids like Unisom, which is uh, doxylamine succinate, or diphenhydramin, which is also used as an allergy medicine. Depression. Getting your gastrointestinal system and sleep managed will help with depression. If you're already on medication for this, talk with your prescribing physician about modifying the dose. Time will help the most, usually about four weeks. So basically it sounds like he's saying you need to get through the roughest part of the post-op. Around four to six weeks after surgery, it's important to begin transitioning off of pain medications. Do not stop this cold turkey or you'll suffer withdrawal symptoms. He then offers an overview of the most important things to remember. Number one, before taking your first step, stand and shift weight back and forth until the leg and hip feel secure. Do this whenever you walk and especially in the morning. Avoid sitting for long periods. Lie down on a couch or bed or walk. 
he separately had uh, told me several times that when he says lie down, he means on a flat surface, like a bed or a couch. He does not recommend recliners. When laying down, don't lay around. Do calf, buttock, and quad pumps to move blood. Number four, avoid using operative leg in rising from chair, stairs, squats, or pivoting. Hip is vulnerable when pushing and twisting hip hard, especially when the hip is bent. Number five, if you feel great, you can drop down to one crutch in the opposite hand, but do not walk without at least one crutch for the first four to six weeks. Discuss this with us at the second week visit. Then he lists out some instances where stress is greatest on the wound and on the implant. First, sitting. Second, rising from a chair. And third, climbing steps. One foot over the next, instead of one step at a time. The first page of the notes that my surgeon, Dr. K, provided me is entitled Planning for Discharge and Activity Recommendations. Hospitals and rehabilitation centers are for sick people, and you don't want to get what the other patients have in those facilities. In most cases, you'll be safer at home and sleep better. Also, in most cases, the joint you had before surgery was worse than the new joint, so if you were getting around before surgery, you should do well after surgery. When you leave the hospital and go home, there are three things to avoid. Number one, avoid aggressive therapy. Patients do not have problems because they did not work hard enough in therapy. It's usually because they did too much and their joint swelled up. You should not do therapy to the point of pain, and you need to stop the session if it is aggravating your joint. Number two, avoid narcotics whenever possible. Do not use narcotics to get through the day and especially therapy. If you numb your joint, you'll overdo it. If you absolutely need narcotics, limit them to at night only if possible. Most post-operative complications are in some way related to narcotics. Narcotics cause nausea, vomiting, and constipation. They cloud your brain and reduce your coordination. It's much easier to slip and fall on narcotics. You will be given a prescription for narcotics, but avoid using them if at all possible, especially during the day. Number three, avoid sitting for prolonged periods of time. Limit sitting for meals to three hours per day. Sitting can lead to a lot of swelling, which puts you at risk for a blood clot. Sitting also puts tremendous pressure on the wound and over time can split open the incision. Lying flat in a bed or on a couch is preferable. Reclining chairs may lay flat, but they make it too easy to slightly bend your joint. It is preferable to only sit in less comfortable chairs than to lose track of time in a comfortable reclining chair. To repeat, avoid too much therapy, narcotics, and sitting. Now, to add my own personal experiences to this, uh, in terms of number one, avoiding aggressive therapy, my surgeon, Dr. K, actually did not recommend any formal physical therapy. He said that unless I had some sort of pre-existing condition, such as a limp or whatnot, there was no need for it. And the only exercise that they really wanted me to do was for endurance of the abductor muscle. And so it was just taking my operative leg, lying on my side, taking my operative leg, and then raising it up and holding it in the air for up to five minutes. It was not a repeated motion, it was just holding it up for endurance. In terms of narcotics, <laughs> constipation is no joke. That made me feel miserable for several days after surgery. And I really have to say, if you can avoid the narcotics, do so. Avoid sitting for prolonged periods of time. So my surgeon really discouraged the use of recliners and he didn't really encourage you to sit in chairs very much at all. So I have to admit, I don't like sitting in bed, but I got used to it. And I found that sitting in a chair for more than a, a short period of time was very uncomfortable for maybe a couple months after surgery. Now this is gonna vary by individual, of course, but I was really surprised. And so I got used to lying in bed and spent the first, I don't know, six weeks there probably. Let's talk about groin pain for a minute. One of the most common symptoms before surgery and after total hip replacement is pain in the groin area. For me, when I was pre-op, that was my main symptom. And in fact, there were about six months where I was suffering from groin pain and did not realize it was a hip problem. So I was treating it with ice and heat and rest and all the kinds of uh, anti-inflammatories and things like that, and nothing was having any effect because it was actually not pain in my groin. It was what's known as referred pain. So what happens is that the femoral nerve passes through the hip and your hip is inflamed, which confuses and aggravates that femoral nerve and sends pain signals through it. So it thinks that it's feeling pain elsewhere 
Whereas the real problem is that your hip is inflamed and it's messing with that nerve. So the way you treat that, or the way that I treated it, was using anti-inflammatories. And I tried several, but the one that worked the best was Meloxicam. It's also known as Mobic. And I took that pre-op for a couple months and it knocked out that major pain, at least made it manageable so that I could survive until surgery. And after surgery, I was still feeling some groin pain, which surprised me a little bit. So I talked to my surgeon and he said, that's normal, go ahead and take that Meloxicam for as long as you need it. And those were his words, as long as you need it. So obviously before surgery, they make you stop taking all those medications, but after surgery, he allowed me to resume the Meloxicam and it took about two weeks to resolve my groin pain. And that really hasn't been a problem since. I think there are a couple lessons to be learned from this. Number one, when we're feeling pain, it may not actually originate at the site where we feel the pain. It could be referred pain caused by something like this inflammation of a nerve. The other thing is that to treat it, you can't treat the area where you feel the pain. You have to treat the source of the problem, which in my case was inflammation in my hip. This next tip is sort of a personal philosophy of mine, and it's that I suggest you minimize change in your life after total hip replacement to reduce the risk of falling in accidents. And the two most common examples that this applies to are people will often ask, what shoes should I wear after surgery? And they'll ask, which side of the bed should I sleep on? And my answer is always the same. When it comes to shoes, wear the same shoes that you always do. I did. All I did was loosen the laces so that I could slip them on and slip them off much more easily. And when it comes to sleeping on the side of the bed, you know, people wonder because of their operative side, should I sleep on the side where my operative side is facing outwards to make it easier to get in and out? That may be true, but in the middle of the night, do you want to get out potentially in a dark room, stumble around and fall and have an accident? To me, that is a much worse thing than the inconvenience of getting out of bed with my operative side on the inside. And that was my case. I sleep on the left side of the bed, but my right hip is the one that was operated on. So yes, it was a little bit more difficult to get in and out of bed, moving that leg, which is pretty useless at the beginning, uh, across the sheets and whatnot. But I felt it was worth it not to have changed my routine. Similarly with shoes, if you're wearing new or different shoes, you have a much higher risk of tripping or something like that and having a bad fall. And we want to avoid that at all cost. With this next tip, you're gonna benefit from some things that I learned from others after my total hip replacement that unfortunately I wasn't able to use because I learned about them too late. So after surgery, your leg is gonna feel useless. It's gonna be like a dead weight. And what you wanna do is as much as possible to reduce friction. For example, <laughs> I had flannel sheets on our bed after total hip replacement because it was in January and those are the sheets we use in the winter. That is a very high friction surface to try and scoot your leg across. So that was not a good idea. Other people have suggested things like satin sheets. I think that's genius and I wish I'd thought of it or known about it beforehand. Similarly, when you're getting in and out of a car, it's hard, you kind of like put your bum in and then you rotate, right? Well, there's a lot of friction on your backside. So one of the suggestions someone mentioned was take a pillow, put it in a plastic bag, and that'll slide really easily. So again, I wish I'd known that sooner, but hopefully you can benefit from my loss. Some other tips for moving that useless leg, you can use your non-operative leg to help lift your operative leg, just kind of hook your foot under it and then lift it up. You can use a leg lifter, which is sort of a long thing with a hoop on the end. I call it an invisible dog leash because that's kind of what it looks like to me. But you hook that around your foot and then you can use your arm strength to lift it up onto the bed or to lower it down off of the bed. And then finally, one of the things that I did a lot was use my own body weight as a counterweight. For example, I would put my backside on the bed and I would grab onto my operative thigh and then I would just kind of rock backwards. So holding my arms in a fixed position and using the rest of my body or my upper body weight to lift that leg into bed. Let's talk about swelling. In addition to just being very uncomfortable, swelling can actually cause problems. For example, when your body's swollen, it's actually stretching ligaments and tendons out of position and that can cause you problems later when the swelling goes down. So it's really important that you get that swelling under control. Different people will have different levels of swelling, but in my case, I had a ton of swelling all in my operative thigh and up around my buttocks and things like that, so that wearing pants or you know, anything was just really, really uncomfortable. So while I was rereading those tips, I found the tips on swelling, and that really helped me. So basically, you want to elevate your leg above your heart and above your head, 
And in my case, what I did is I actually got rid of my pillows. I was laying absolutely flat on the bed and then built a giant mountain of pillows under my legs. And in about a day, I was able to knock it out. If you want to see more details about how I address the swelling, check out this video. Another thing that can really help with swelling is ice. And I'd recommend these hip ice packs from Amazon. They were amazing. All the other ice packs I had were too small or too weird of a shape to be effective, but these work great and other people have used them successfully as well. Another option, if you can afford it, is an ice machine. I got one years ago with my shoulder surgery, but I did have to buy a separate little sleeve that was specifically for hip use so that I could use it for my hip and it worked great. I understand that sometimes you can rent these machines and your doctor's office might be able to give you a recommendation of where to pick one up. Also related to swelling is compression socks. The compression socks they give you at the hospital are lousy. I really had a hard time with those. You can buy better compression socks on Amazon or another outlet, and those will be a lot easier to put on and to take off. I wish I had done that myself. I'll reiterate something here that's been mentioned elsewhere in the video in my Dr. K's notes, and that is to wean off narcotics. That is so important, and in my case, the main reason was the constipation that it caused. I was in absolute misery for several days after surgery because of the constipation. So, you know, as much as is possible, wean off those narcotics. One of the things that really surprised me during the first week after surgery was how difficult it was to get up and down off of the toilet. But basically, depending on your height, you want to make sure that your toilet is high enough. And in my case, I'm 6'2", so I got a high-rise toilet. Thankfully, we already had that installed. That means I have less, less to get up, right? I'm already at a certain height, so I can, you know, don't have as far to push up. But um, I wish, again, this is one of those ones where I wish I had known this stuff beforehand. It was very difficult to get up off the toilet and to get down. And so what I would have to do is like have my operative leg straight out in front of me because you don't want to use it to get up or down. That pushing motion would be very bad at that stage of recovery. And then I would try and use my hands on the bowl or using like one crutch. I would try to lift myself up or lower myself down. It was very, very difficult. I felt sort of like at risk of a problem and it was bad on my upper body. So definitely you want to do some things to make that easier. Now tips that I've heard from other people in addition to the height of your toilet are things like use a walker. So I, I didn't have a walker so I couldn't do that. But if you have the walker positioned in front of the toilet, then you can kind of use that to lower yourself down or lift yourself up. Other people have installed handles on the walls next to the toilet. I think that would be a good idea. And there have even been some people that have built sort of freestanding things, you know, out of wood that you can grab onto to push up off of. So give that some thought. And I would go so far as to say, if you're watching this before surgery, try it out. Try getting up off of your toilet seat and lowering yourself down onto your toilet seat without using your operative leg. Try to just have it straight out in front of you without the knee bent and see if you can manage that. And then try and adjust your toilet to accommodate joint. So if you're experiencing groin pain, I hope this helps. Um, one of the other big, big tips that I have is to get outside and get fresh air and sunshine. Truly, this is underestimated for all recovery, not just hip replacement, all surgery, when we're sick, when we're feeling depressed. I mean, there's so many things that we go through that just getting outside and getting fresh air and sunshine can literally change the way that we feel. Another thing is to move every 60 to 90 minutes while you're awake. It doesn't have to be long, five or 10 minutes, um, but it really helps with the stiffness, with the swelling, things like that. Um, you might actually I say swelling, but you may swell a little bit after you move. Totally normal, totally okay. Use your wedge pillow, put some ice on it. Use those to your advantage, but do move. I promise you it'll be so worth it. It's gonna help with your mobility long-term. Um, it's going to help you to mitigate the risk of blood clots, very, very important. Um, plus, I really feel like it helps our mental health as we're going through this recovery process um, because that's one part of it that's not really talked about. Um, sometimes it can get, you can feel down not doing anything, feeling restricted, feeling like you don't have your full autonomy of your body. Getting up and moving is really, really important. Last thing, I promise you'll get through this. You will get through this. It is going to feel like the longest days of your life in the beginning. It really, truly will. Uh, once you get past the first, it's like chapters. So once you get past the first two to five days, it's like you go into a new phase. And then it's like the first couple weeks. And then you've entered into a new phase. And then after that, 
it just kind of progressively gets better. I will tell you for the first three weeks, I feel like it's very rapid improvement. Then it kind of stagnates a little bit. And then your, your improvement tends to be a bit more gradual. But those first few weeks, it is insane how things change every couple of days on the positive for most people. Now, obviously, every part of this conversation is going to come with nuance. Everybody has different experiences. Not everybody goes the, same, the exact same thing for a variety of reasons. But generally speaking, from my own experience, as well as talking to other people, that it truly does get better. Every day truly does get better. Ladies, let's talk about our cycles. This is something that um, is going to be more important for the younger demographic of people who go through this procedure and really any surgery in general, but we're talking about hip replacement, so that's what we're going to touch on. Um, men that have the surgery obviously don't have to worry about it. Women who have the surgery post-menopause don't have to worry about this, but we're finding that these hip replacement surgeries are taking place in younger people more frequently these days. So there's going to be more women that are in the age of menstruation that are going to be having this done. I will share with you that number one, your cycle will probably be thrown off, at least temporarily, maybe for at least a cycle, potentially even two, sometimes three. I was off for about one cycle. I was a little bit late, um, which is totally normal. So don't let that freak you out. Um, you're probably not having any intimate time with your spouse or partner anyways, so you're probably not pregnant. Um, but for some of us who are used to having really regular cycles, that can be a little um, upsetting. <laughs> so expect that. Um, also expect that it's totally uncomfortable. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, I don't know what kind of feminine hygiene products you use, but depending on which kind you use, it's a little bit challenging to use the products um, because you, you are limited in your movement and it's just uncomfortable. I mean, that's the reality of it. What we've just gone through is super uncomfortable. Like the, the recovery of the surgery is just gonna take time. And some of those everyday movements that we've been used to or every month movements that we've been used to, you're just gonna have to adjust. Just like with everything else, you're walking, you're sitting, like all of these things take adjustments. Using your feminine hygiene products, same exact thing. Um, so just be patient through that process, ladies. It's just what it is. There's really nothing we can do about it. Just expect a couple of those things, cycle fluctuation and just kind of being annoyed in general with the process of having to deal with the monthly. It's just is what it is, but I wanted to throw that tip in there because most people historically that have had this aren't dealing with this anymore. So more younger um, groups of women are getting it done. So I feel like it was important to touch on. As I wrap up this section on week one post-op tips, I just want to leave you with one last thought. You'll get through this. It'll be okay, and you'll be so glad that you did it. This section includes tips for weeks two through six post-op. I'll start by sharing Dr. K's notes. Before we hear the wisdom of Dr. K, I'd really like to know what sort of topics you'd like to hear about in upcoming hip vlogs. So I've got a couple ideas, but if there's something else that you're interested in, please let me know in the comments. Hiking the Camino Santiago in Spain at six months post-op. I just completed that. It was six days and 72 miles. Getting back to playing volleyball, and I think that generally can be applied to almost any sport. Bone inflammation and the setback that I'm suffering right now at seven months post-op. And I will say it's not unrelated to the hiking and the volleyball. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to turn out, but we all seem to suffer setbacks at various times, so I could create a hip vlog about that. A pre-op tips guide or a pre-op buying guide. Double hippie tips for folks going through double hip replacements or more post-op tips because there are some that didn't make it into this video and I'm sure I'll learn of others as time goes by. So please let me know in the comments what you'd like to hear about in upcoming hip vlogs. Thanks in advance. The wound should be red, warm with some swelling, but otherwise essentially healed. Many patients worry that these may be early signs of infection, but that's not the case. Unless they're draining pus, have a high fever greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.5 degrees Celsius, or have pain greater than that seen with large bone fractures, which is pretty serious pain. The wound is still at risk of breaking open should the patient be too active or have any significant trauma. Next, I'd like to cover some of Dr. K's tips on using stairs. And I'm going to try and include this in the video because I'm not going to cover every little detail, but I would like you guys to have this information for reference just in case you find it interesting or helpful. Okay, so Dr. K says, continue to do stairs one at a time, up with the good, down with the bad. The other way they said I can remember that is uh, 
good goes to heaven, so up with the good, and bad goes to hell, so down with the bad. Whatever helps you remember. So anyhow, continue to do stairs one at a time, up with the good, down with the bad. When full strength and coordination have recovered, some patients are ready to do stairs two steps at a time, one foot over the other. Do this in a protected fashion. Use one crutch and railing for operative leg. Do not alternate steps unprotected during the first six weeks post-op, even if you're off crutches around the house. Do not begin protected alternating steps until discussing it with us at three weeks post-op. Now, let me just add a couple things to this. He talks about continuing to use crutches on the stairs for a pretty long time. And personally, this gets back to my earlier comment about not changing things, right? So they did have me practice using crutches before I had the surgery, which I thought was a brilliant idea, and I would highly recommend that. So if you can, figure out what you're going to be using post-op, walker, crutches, whatever, and practice using that for several weeks pre-op before you have the surgery. It made a big difference in my case. That said, I find using crutches increases my risk of tripping or falling. So for example, when I'm going for a walk in the neighborhood and I'm using a crutch, the ground is not absolutely flat, right? There are slight fluctuations in the ground, especially if you're walking on a road. And so sometimes that crutch will catch and I might stumble forward. So I actually was better off not using the crutch at least I felt safer. And I talked to my wife about this to try and figure out, you know, what the best approach was. But she agreed. She's had several, you know, broken ankle, broken leg situations where she's had to use crutches for extended periods of time. And she agreed that, you know, they're not a natural extension of our bodies and they do, to a certain extent, increase our risk of falling. So you have to make your own best judgment. But in my case, I did stop using the crutches walking and on the stairs where, again, I thought, you know, going up and down stairs is risky enough, but having this weird stick in the way, I mean, that was just adding risk in my book. So I used the railings. I was very slow and cautious, very deliberate. I made sure I was wearing nice grippy shoes or barefoot, not wearing socks, which was, you know, apt to cause a slip or a fall. Um, but the crutches, I felt was a little bit problematic. Anyhow, I hope this helps. Again, this is just my tip, my philosophy. I'm trying to minimize my risk of falling and I felt like using the crutches after a certain point increased my risk. Now, sometimes I will say that I still kept the crutch with me. I wouldn't use it, but I would walk with it in my hand. And that was more to warn other people that I was in a fragile situation, right? So if I went for walks on our greenway, we have people coming by walking their dogs, we have people riding bikes. So they may not be cautious around me, right? They may let their dog go hoppity hop, you know, hey, hello, stranger. And I don't want that because, you know, that dog might jump up on me and cause me to fall and, and ruin my hip surgery. So having the crutch with me sent those people a message. Similarly, when people are zipping by on bikes, you know, if they see that crutch, they're gonna be a little bit more cautious, they're gonna give you a wider berth, and that's gonna reduce your risk of having a problem. Do what makes you happy. In my case, I'm wearing this orange shirt today because I love orange. It's my favorite color, and I don't know why, but every time I see orange, I get a smile on my face. It makes me happy. So I try to surround myself with as much orange as possible. Actually, if you could see the office around me, the walls are all painted orange as well. <laughs> Anyhow, as it relates to total hip replacement though, it has to do with prioritization. So for example, I do a lot of different things to stay physically fit, but my one love is volleyball. And so when the doctor told me that I should probably discontinue running, that was not a hard decision for me. I mean, I have always run for 30 years or more just for fitness. And I think it's an amazing workout. I think there's almost no other activity that will give you the same type of workout that running does. But that was not very hard for me to give up. Um, I don't love running for running's sake. I would say my body doesn't love running either. I mean, regardless of the hip issues, I've just never uh, felt awesome after running like joints and muscle stiffness and things like that. But aerobically, boy, that is an amazing workout. So my tip here is, as you go through your recovery, try to think about the activities that are most important to you and 
you know, work toward regaining those activities and maybe give up some activities that are not as high of an importance for you. And by the way, you know, my surgeon kind of discouraged me from running. He said, you know, that's going to wear out the prosthetic and it's just, you know, one of the most pounding and uh, demanding types of activities. I know that there are lots of other surgeons out there that are saying running is okay. They're even saying it's okay pretty soon after total hip replacement. So you're going to have to make your own choices. In my case, I decided to give up running and uh, you know, that's okay, but I'll keep biking. I'll keep hiking. I'll keep playing volleyball. I'm going to continue doing weights, all the other activities I'm used to. This is an important one to remember. Complete healing can take up to one full year. That's hard to believe and it's hard to remember sometimes when we see how quickly we're progressing and outwardly how completely healed and normal we seem. And it's also difficult for others to understand because, I mean, I regularly would have people come up to me and they didn't even remember that I'd had hip replacement a month or two earlier. Um, I was not walking with a limp. I was not necessarily using crutches or any other aids. And so they really didn't understand that I still had a lot of healing to do. Similarly, you know, when you're looking at yourself, don't overdo it. You are still going to be healing for a long time. So you want to pay attention to that and act accordingly. Even though I've mentioned it before, I wanted to reiterate something that's related to the last tip. And that is keep a crutch with you even after you no longer need it as a sign to others to be cautious around you and to avoid overfriendly dogs. Recovering from total hip replacement, which is a major surgery, takes a lot of time and effort. Not just physical effort, but also mental effort and focus. But the good news is that the investments you make will pay dividends and help you regain your life, your previous level of activity and fitness. Don't overdo it and suffer a setback. Remember to ease back into everything. So if you're asking that question, when can I fill in the blank, you know, bike, run, swim, go back to work, whatever, try to ease back into everything using baby steps. That's going to be the best way to approach just about anything. And remember, progress, no matter how small, is still progress. And celebrate those small wins. I mean, <laughs> when you can put your socks back on by yourself, that's actually a huge victory. So celebrate. This next tip has to do with your overall fitness level. As you're recovering from total hip replacement, remember, don't just do the minimum stuff related to recovering your hip. Try to work on your overall fitness. This is just part of my overall life philosophy, but I really think it helped me recover from my total hip replacement. Now, remember, I'm not a medical professional of any kind, so remember all the disclaimers that I mentioned earlier in the video, but I do think that this is important, and if you want to live your best life, it's very important. I like to use the car as an analogy. A car sitting idle in a garage for long periods of time or being driven only slow and for short distances is not going to be in as good a shape as a car that's driven regularly and maintained regularly and gets plenty of exercise. So similarly, take care of your body. It's the only one you get. You can buy a new car, but you can't buy a new body, even though we might think so after getting total hip replacement. If you work to improve your overall fitness after total hip replacement and not just do the bare minimum, it'll help with a lot of things, including it'll help your mood. It'll help with sleep. It'll stimulate your immune system and promote faster healing. Stronger muscles will take the load off joints, prolonging joint life. Increased blood flow from aerobic activities helps clean all the toxins out of your systems and increase oxygenation of all your tissues. And you'll be able to engage more fully in life. So please, make overall fitness a priority for the rest of your life. For the first six weeks, remember to take stairs one at a time, not leg over leg. Remember to maintain the proper angle so that your knee is never higher than your hip, right? So use a booster where necessary. I still use mine. Regarding range of motion and activity restrictions, you are going to find a million different answers to this. Some people will allow you to do almost any activity. Others will restrict you from almost everything. Try to use common sense and look objectively at where you are. What is your level of fitness? How are you doing before surgery? What is comfortable for you? and try to act accordingly. Okay, I'm dressed in character as a doctor or surgeon again today to read you some more notes from my Dr. K. This is for the second post-operative visit, which was at about six weeks after surgery. And the title of this is Summary of Six Weeks to Six Months Activities. It is common to have abductor muscle weakness. It's important to continue strengthening exercises. You've just been through the most difficult part of your recovery. 
You'll continue to make improvements for up to a year to a year and a half. Keep doing your exercises at home. You're well on your way to full recovery. There are good times to look forward to in the upcoming months. Most people have been able to stop using both crutches or have progressed to only one. You need to use one crutch until you can walk well without it. Do not quit using your crutch until you can walk comfortably without a limp. You may discontinue the use of your TEDS hose starting today. The TEDS hose are those compression socks. Um, they're meant to avoid uh, deep vein thrombosis and blood clots after surgery. And I was initially told I needed to wear those for about six weeks, which is why you see this in the six week to six month uh, notes. But they actually allowed me to ditch those at about two and a half weeks. Okay, you can stop taking the Colase, ferrous gluconate, and aspirin unless your other doctors have told you to still take them. And over the following months, you'll continue to gain strength, flexibility, and endurance. Inflammation in the joint can be monitored by looking at the redness of your skin incision. The redness will decrease over the next year, which is an indicator of the inflammation of your joint. Until the redness disappears and the incision returns close to skin color, your operative joint will remain symptomatic. We suggest that you do not drive until you are not taking narcotic medications and you are able to walk without a limp. This will usually take two to six weeks. Now, I will note this does depend on where you are because in the UK, for example, there is a law that says you may not drive for six weeks after total hip replacement. So, you know, take the advice of your doctor and pay attention to local regulations. At eight to 12 weeks, which is two to three months after surgery, most people are able to return to light work for limited periods of time. For a full day's work at a desk job, we recommend that you wait until three to four months after surgery. Light to moderate labor is not suggested until around four to six months. Now I will add about the return to work question because a lot of people are concerned about that and ask that question. Everyone's individual circumstances are different. Some folks having total hip replacement are retired while others are still in their working prime or have young children. So depending upon what stage of life you're in, it can be very difficult if you are unable to perform your obligations as a parent or as the breadwinner in the family. So what I always try to recommend to people is that whatever you're returning to, try to do it in stages, in baby steps. So let's use work for an example. If you need to return to work, whatever the type of job you have, try not to return full time all at once. Try to arrange something where you can work part time for a week or two and you know, see how it goes because it's possible that you may suffer some sort of setback or inflammation or some other issue. So it's always better to ease back into these things rather than to have an abrupt change. So that's my one piece of advice regardless of what your situation is. Getting back into sports should be for the pure enjoyment, not competitive. At two to six months, you may begin to swim, including light water aerobics. Golf may not be comfortable until after three to six months, but you can begin using the driving range after you can walk without a limp or a crutch. After six months to one year, depending on each individual's progression, you may ride a bike, dance, or play doubles tennis. No strenuous sports or running should be performed during this period. For example, no singles tennis and no competitive ski slopes. Only use beginner slopes. The purpose should be to enjoy the outdoors, not to compete. And again, kind of related to the note earlier about abductor strengthening, he provides this diagram. Since cars and driving are such an important part of our lives, this section collects all the different tips related to cars and driving in one place. In terms of getting in and out of a car and what's most comfortable, it's going to partially depend on your height. Whatever the height is though, you wanna make sure you sit like this, right? So that you have a 90 degree angle between your knee and your hip, right? So your body should be like this. And that's important because the hip joint right here, you want to have that nice 90 degree angle. You wouldn't wanna have, for example, your knees be higher because that puts a lot of strain on the hip joint. So either it should be 90 degrees or even less, right? So for example, if you're tall like me, that means you're gonna be more comfortable in a car that has high seats. So like a pickup truck or a van or an SUV. And even so, you might need to use a booster pillow or something like that. So when getting in and out or when sitting in the passenger, make sure you use a, an appropriate vehicle and add boosters as necessary.
One of my collaborators, Heidi, said, uh, never forget to go in bottom first and then swing in your legs together. And related to that, I just wanted to mention when getting in and out of a car after total hip replacement, friction is the enemy. And so what you want to do is whatever you can to reduce that friction. The best way to do that is to have like a pillow inside of a plastic bag, because then when you sit on that and rotate, that just slides, 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 no friction at all. If you've got a smaller car, then it can be a little bit challenging to get in and drive that after total hip replacement for several months. So if you want some tips or just a good laugh, then check out this video of me getting into my teeny tiny sports car. When driving as a passenger, it can be pretty uncomfortable. All those stabilizer muscles, the abductors, the adductors, the hip flexors, those muscles are shot after total hip replacement and they're teeny tiny little muscles. It takes a very long time for them to recover and to get strong again. So when you're driving in a car and it's kind of, you know, jostling down the road, you don't even notice that those little muscles are firing constantly to stabilize your body and your leg. And after hip surgery, that's just agony. I remember very clearly driving home from the hospital and it was just torture. I took my crutch and I tried to like wedge it up against my operative leg so that it wouldn't move around so much because it was killing me. So just a tip here, you know, right after surgery, when you're coming home from the hospital, you might want to bring some pillows with so you can kind of wedge your leg so it's not jostling back and forth. Also for the first few weeks, maybe even up to the first month or two after surgery, if you're taking any significant car trips, you might want have some pillows or something to try and you know secure your leg so it's not going to move around a lot until those muscles have had a chance to recover and get strong again. At seven months post-op I still find when I'm lifting my operative leg out of a car it feels weak much weaker than my non-operative leg so like I said it can take a very long time for that stuff to recover. Of course the big question related to cars and driving is when can I drive again? Well, that's going to depend on a lot of factors. For example, if you live in the UK, my understanding is that there's a law that says that you cannot drive until six weeks post-op from total hip replacement. So you'll have to be careful of that. In other parts of the world where it's really up to the individual or their surgical team, you have to judge that based on what you think is right. My surgeon said two things. He said, as soon as you're off the narcotics and as soon as you can walk without a limp, then you should be able to drive successfully. And so for me, I tried driving the very first time at about two weeks post-op. I asked my wife to drive me down to the pool here in our neighborhood, and I just made sure I could drive around the parking lot there. I didn't try anything on the actual roads. And then I, even for the next couple weeks, I really didn't drive very much because I knew I could drive, but my reactions and those, again, those little muscles in my legs were weak. And so I was not confident that I was a safe driver. I mean, yes, 99% of the time it's fine. But if someone you know, pulled in front of me or there was an emergency situation, my reactions probably would have been slower than normal. So use common sense when getting back behind the wheel.